Hi, I'm John, the MedPod Engineer Termel, and this is part three of the case of R versus James Turner, cultivation of marijuana, the decision of Justice Lalonde of the Ontario Superior Court, where he dismissed it as frivolous and vexatious, so he didn't have to give it any thought. 24. Uh, 23. It's noted in that case, Thompson J. had ordered the Crown Counsel to assist Mr. Turner in notifying the Attorney General of Ontario that Mr. Turner was bringing a constitutional challenge. And he wasn't. <laughs> this was done. The constitutional challenge. And the Attorney General of Ontario declined the invitation to get involved in Mr. Turner's application as it presented itself as a constitutional issue that can be dealt with by the trial judge and not as an extraordinary remedy issue. And actually, it's not being dealt with as a constitutional issue at all. We're not going to raise a constitutional issue that the law is bad again, like Parker and Krieger did, once we've had a ruling on whether or not the law is alive since they killed it, right? Why should we waste our time doing another constitutional argument that it's bad when we still haven't had the chance to prove the law is still dead? So, 24, I agree with Crown Counsel's written submission, which states that, this is Judge Lalonde, this is an application better suited for a trial court, whereby Mr. Turner could raise a constitutional application and appeal any error therefrom. We're not doing a constitutional application, Justice Lalonde. You got it backwards. To elaborate, the basis of Mr. Turner's prohibition application is that the Superior Court of Justice should prohibit the charges from proceeding because he has not been charged with an offense known to law. That's right, and that's not a constitutional application. So how come this judge properly states that it's an application to declare it unknown to law while at the same time thinking it's a constitutional application? Don't these judges learn about law? However, it has long been established in Ontario that the prohibition is not available to restrain a judge from proceeding with an information which does not disclose a criminal offense. Oh, really? So if you don't, if the, if the charge ain't valid, you can't prohibit the charge, they say. <laughs> or is defective in substance or form. Oh, if it's defective, you still can't stop the trial. Ah, unless the statute under which the information was laid is ultra vires in the case of CDSA. Well, we're saying that the prohibitions against possession and marijuana are ultra vires. So, the issue of whether or not an information discloses a criminal offense is a matter for the trial judge. Well, why can't a judge at the higher level see it too? I further agree with Crown Counsel's written submission that I reproduce to arrive at the conclusion that Mr. Turner has no standing to argue on behalf of the citizens of Canada as he has done. A. Canadian Council of Churches versus Canada is a leading Supreme Court of Canada case on the law of standing in Canada. B. The court acknowledged the need for public interest standing in principle to ensure that government is not immunized from constitutional challenges to legislation. C. However, the court also stressed the need to strike a balance between ensuring access to the courts and preserving judicial resources, citing the concern of an unnecessary proliferation of marginal and redundant suits brought by well-meaning organizations pursuing their own particular cases, certain in the knowledge that their cause is all important. The latter concern is the exact situation that we are faced with here. This matter is a redundant application, regardless of whether it's been brought by a well-meaning intent by Mr. Turner. By virtue of the fact that this application has substantively been argued twice by Mr. Turmel, both times the hearing judges denying the application, and in both situations an appeal to the Ontario Court of Appeal being dismissed, and of course not having the five judges necessary to have the jurisdiction to dismiss it, so a court with no jurisdiction to hear it, dismissing it, doesn't mean anything, does it? And E, the current, of course they didn't tell this judge that, did they? E, the current test for standing, as summarized in the Canadian Council of Church's decision, <clears throat> considers three factors. Is there a serious issue raised to the invalidity of the legislation in question? Well, there's four epileptics a day who are dying out of the ten a day who have seizures, four who knew they were epileptic, who should have had a joint to prevent it, like Terry Parker does. Four epileptics a day dying, not important to this judge. Two, has it been established that the plaintiff is directly affected by the legislation, or if not, 
does the plaintiff have a genuine interest in its validity? Well, he's been charged. I guess he's got an interest. C three, is there another reasonable and effective way to bring the issue before the court? Well, not before going through a lengthy trial process, there isn't. The Supreme Court went on to hold that this last factor is an onerous one, the obligation filing on the applicant to establish. Well, he's saying, I don't want to go to a trial and get a lawyer to do a defense until I know whether my offense works, that the law is dead, which he can do himself. F. Given that the matter has previously been brought to the court in a manner sufficiently effective for the court to rule on the issue, this request should be denied. So the fact Termel raised the issue and the fact Termel got in front of three judges who didn't have the jurisdiction to overrule the Hesse decision means that he was properly heard. Not. G. Mr. Turner only has standing to request an order or remedy for his own particular proceedings. In that capacity, he is seeking that his own charges be stayed as an abuse of process on the grounds that all statutes governing marijuana are no force in effect. Mr. Turner is, in essence, arguing that his rights, as protected under Section 7 of the Charter, have been violated, and he is seeking a stay of proceedings as a remedy under Section 24 of the Charter. This is an application to be addressed by the trial judge. Yes, it would be if he were making a constitutional argument, but he's not. He's making one unknown to law. 26. I find that considering the above analysis, there are no grounds to cite the Minister of Justice in contempt of court, which conduct, in any event, pertains to matters involved in other courts. 27. Mr. Turner did not bring a tape recorder to this hearing. He would not have been allowed to use it, in any event, as I would not have been persuaded that, pursuant to Rule 36.2b of the Interior Rules of Practice, the only purpose for the audio recording would have been to supplement his handwritten notes. So, he's going to presume that Turner has a nefarious reason and say no. Is he going to tell us what this presumption is? I don't think so. Uh, I'm concerned that a blog has already been set up through a website operated by John Turnell, which includes a copy of the Crown's notice of the opposition in this particular matter. Wow, I've been publishing the Crown's documents for the last nine years, and this judge is starting to be worried about it. The chances that an audio recording in the circumstances of this case can be corrupted or modified would be too great, even though in the past, where he including the Court of Appeal, his bosses let me tape record the decision, and they'd been told I was going to transcribe it and publish the text on the internet, and the court still went, okay, this judge says no. I grant the Crown's motion and summarily dismiss Mr. Turner's application. So no thought about whether they're right or wrong, he just figures because it's a constitutional issue, which it's not, and other bad reasons, he's going to dismiss it. It is my hope that in the future, such frivolous and vexatious applications for prohibition will not prevent Crown Council across the province of Ontario to get on with the prosecutions of charges such as we have in this case. Yes, under laws that do not exist, because you can't prohibit prosecutions under laws that do not exist, they said. The constitutional questions raised by the Turmels and Turners of this world are matters to be decided by the trial judge from whom an appeal lies to the Ontario Court of Appeal. There should be no further interruption of the trial process. Of course, the trial process hasn't started yet, right? <laughs> With applications such as discussed in this case. I also think that applicants like Mr. Turmel and Mr. Turmel Turner should pay court costs when frivolous applications are brought before the courts. So, the decision of James Turner before Justice Lalonde, who completely backward and makes all these mistakes, dismissed his case, and this was the appeal they were trying to railroad through, saying, oh, if this judge found it frivolous and vexatious, I guess he doesn't need factums, I guess we can skip all the procedures, no need for certificates of completion, we'll just go ahead and do it again and say because it's frivolous, you should just throw it out. And, of course, Justice McPherson treated it the same way. When he was apprised of a situation that the Crown had done some dirty backroom shenanigans, rather than stop it and look into it, he just let it go forward. So, we're going to do a complaint now to the Registrar and to the Chief Justice about Justice McPherson letting this piece of bull, this corrupt process, go through. He should know better. If a judge doesn't know that you need to have a certificate of completion and factums and everything set before you go to appeal, he shouldn't be sitting in the court of appeal. So, 